court of the world. Court of the world is not her for gospel. Uh, and we're going to pray about that next week. Next Sunday is Prayer Sunday. We're going to ask you to be ready to pray, uh, to come for a different kind of day, a different kind of moment. Um, turn on the map. I mean, if we're going to pray, there's got to be a heart that breaks for some of these people, right? We've got people in our lives that heart breaks for them. And then we weep. What happens? What happens as we weep? Jesus tells us, Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now that's an interesting statement, because the Greek word blessed can often mean to be happy. Be happy when you're crying, because you'll be comforted. doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? <coughs> Feel? Does it make sense, or, or does it make complete sense to you? Be happy when you're crying, because comfort's coming. It makes a little bit of sense, but, but it almost feels like a contradiction. How can blessing come from weeping? How can smiles come from tears? Why does it, Jesus seem to encourage weeping in this passage? Why, why does Jesus weep in other passages? I mean, we look at a passage like Luke 19, verse 41, as Jesus approached Jerusalem. And he saw the city. He wept over it. Is there anything in your life that gets you close to the point of tears? Is, is there a relationship? Is there a concern? Is there something, someone, that, that leads you to that point? Because Jesus has some words for us for that kind of person. Jesus was that kind of person. He wept. In fact, the shortest passage, verses in the Bible, verse in the Bible, says what? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And all the kids at camp are like, I'm going to memorize that one. It's worth ten points and it's really easy. Jesus wept. You know? But what is it about weeping that is beneficial? What is it about Jesus that leads him to tears? Why? Why are we encouraged to cry? About six years ago, I was in charge of the King. Um, and it was a good week King. We had um, really good staff there. We had two different colleges which would send teams to, to help with the week of King. Um, one of the speakers for it was super creative, uh, made me look like I'm reliable and, and unpre I mean, just completely predictable. That's how unpredictable he was. Okay? So if you ever think, oh, what is Nathan going to do this Sunday? Could you imagine him? <laughs> Eric was his name. I mean, Eric was off the wall, wild and crazy. We had these crazy games, and it was this epic week of camp where there was so much spiritual food offered and so much fun offered. And during that week, there was this, this, this faculty member there. Her name was Jana. And, and Jana just started to cry. Throughout the week, she started to cry. And I'm like, Jana, why are, are you crying? Nathan, because they're missing it. Because God is putting so much in front of them, and they're missing almost all of it. And if there's anything that will make us weep, seeing someone throw away something we find valuable can do that, right? I mean, there are these moments where, where we hear about someone showing up at Goodwill or someone showing up at a garage sale and they buy for $2 this priceless treasure this incredible artifact. And we sit there and think, oh, that poor family that just sold it, that poor Goodwill or that poor whatever it is, they just sold for $2 something that was worth $200,000. They, they missed it. They missed it. And that's terrible. Sometimes we miss it. It's set right before us. Something wonderful. Something beautiful. And, and we miss it.
because we're too busy watching TV or too busy updating our Facebook if you're from that generation or checking our cell phone or too busy thinking about the problems in our own life. And I wonder if God weeps as we miss it. I know I've, I've watched my friends miss opportunities. And it's brought me to that point where I'm like, oh, that's so terrible. They missed a chance to turn things around. They missed a chance to start fresh. They missed a chance to save their family or save their marriage. And they missed it. And because they missed it, God weeps. He wept. And Jesus weeps here. Because he's looking out over a city filled with all these people. And they're missing. And I want to ask you today, are you missing it? Or are you getting it? Are you missing it or are you getting it? Because this is one of the, the huge problems that I see facing our culture today. Is so much, never has so much been offered to one group of people as it has here in America. We have been offered infinite possibilities. And the question is, what are we doing with it? What are we doing? Are we using it, missing it, or abusing it? Jesus looked out at this city that was worth weeping over, and he said to them in Luke chapter 19, verse 42, and he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Now there's a game going on here, by the way. Um, you guys ever heard the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom? Everybody say shalom. Shalom, shalom okay? You guys are becoming Hebrew scholars. This is great, okay? Now, I want you to say the name of the city of Jerusalem. 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 Do you understand what the city of Jerusalem means now? Something of peace, right? And I would guess city too, by the way. Um, but when I looked it up, it's the foundation of peace. When David came into Jerusalem, he started <coughs> building it up. He, he was, had been this warrior kind of king, this warrior kind of prince. And when he started building it up, you know what he hoped for? Peace. He hoped it would be the foundation of peace. And... and as Jesus walks into the foundation of peace, what does he do? He weeps because they're missing. I mean, ultimately, peace for the Hebrew culture back there had four facets, um, four realms in which you would find peace. Realm number one in which you find peace was peace with God. This is my relationship with God is solid. I know where he is. I can feel him speaking and working and acting in my life. Rule number two is peace with ourselves. I'm comfortable with who I am. I, I like myself. I like my gifts. I like my shape, my abilities. I, I like where I am. And I'm, I'm happy and at peace with myself. Uh, realm number three, that there could be peace with is peace with other people. When we hear peace, this is what we think of, isn't it? I get along with others. There's harmony between me and my friends. There's even a kind of harmony between me and my acquaintances. And, and really, there's even harmony between me and, and, and everyone in the world. Don't you love to be able to say that? I have peace with everyone. And then the fourth realm of peace is peace with nature. Some people, you just, you're walking with them, or you're hanging out with them, and they see a worm, or they see a bird, or they see a rabbit, and they're like, oh! And you can tell what? They love it, and they have peace in realm number four. They have, they have peace with nature. They look, and they say, oh, look, the cloud looks like a dragon. And, and you're like, it looks like a cotton ball to me. <laughs> and, and there are. There are people who get it when it comes to nature. There are people who get it when it comes to people. There are people who get it when it comes to themselves. And there are people who get it when it comes to God. But a true person of peace 
has peace in all four realms. And David built Jerusalem hoping it was the foundation of peace for all four realms. But after that, guess what happened? Guess who had peace? Not the people of Israel. They missed it. And peace can only be found in Christ as we live in Him and trust with Him. Because the truth is, we live in a world where it says you need to fight for peace. And if you fight for peace, what's the reality? You don't really have it. We simply mask the disharmony under a specter of fear, power, or intimidation. Peace can only be found one way. In sacrifice. Let me say that again. Peace can only be found in one way. In sacrifice. Somebody has to give up for there to be peace. And that's what the message of the Bible is. What the message of Jesus is. Somebody has to give up for there to be peace. And all of us look in our lives and we say, I know who that should be. It should be them. It ought to be him or her. But it shouldn't ever, ever, ever be me. I shouldn't have to give up for peace. But Jesus came to teach a totally different way. If we're going to walk in the steps of Christ, then we've got to start listening to what He said. And on a certain amount, after saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted, He said some other things. Verse 40, I tell you, don't resist an evil person. This is Matthew 5, 40. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, Turn to him the other also. It's like, make the sacrifice. If they slap you and insult you, or they slap you and they hurt you, do what? <coughs> sacrifice and turn the other cheek. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone wants your possessions and they're trying to take your possessions, what does peace and harmony try to do? It sacrifices. Because sacrifice inspires others to sacrifice. These are radical ways of achieving peace. Ways, quite frankly, the church has often given up on and stopped practicing. We try so hard to hold on to the things we have to, that we want. Matthew 5.42. Ready for this one? Give to the one who asks you. And don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Alright, I'm not going to preach another word until you get the question that everyone wants to ask after they hear that passage. What's the question, Danny? How much do I have to give? Because my fear, yours too, if I keep giving, what will they keep doing? Asking. And they'll keep taking. And if I keep giving, and they keep taking, and I keep giving, and they keep taking, like, like, let's pretend Tara isn't perfect, although she is, okay? Let's just pretend for five seconds that, that she says, hey, Nathan, can you do this for me? And because I love her, I sacrifice. Well, what if she says five minutes later, hey, Nathan, can you do this for me? And it says, give to the one who asks you, so then what should I do if I love Jesus? I should keep sacrificing. So she asks again, and I sacrifice again, and she asks again, and then I start saying, but well, what if I'm the only one who's sacrificing? Yeah. Yeah. She's being selfish. They're being selfish. And, and here's the thing. If I turn the other cheek, won't I be hurt? If I keep giving, won't I end up with nothing? Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Everyone who loves me must pick up their cross and follow me. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about what that meant. Because when Jesus died on the cross, how much clothes did he have? Oh, how much money did he have? 
How many possessions did he have? How much self-respect did he have? How many times did he get hit? Huh? I don't think at that particular moment he yeah. He became sin for us. Like you're saying, at that particular moment he had nothing. The way of peace for him was complete and total sacrifice. Jesus had no money, no home, no cult of his own to ride in Jerusalem. He had no bed on which to lay his head. He was struck and he turned the other cheek at least 40 times that day. If you watch the passion, you sit there and you say, he went through that for me to give me peace? And then he looks at me and he says, here's how I want you to establish peace. And as he's hanging on the cross, he says, Father, please get revenge for me. Father, punish them tomorrow. Right? What do you say? The way of peace is through sacrifice. In your marriage, with your parents, with your siblings, with your children, your grandchildren, your co-workers, with that person who... You can think of right now when I say that person that drives you crazy, whose name just went right in your head, right? <laughs> the way of peace is surrender. Christianity is about peace, not about prosperity. And this is the mistake the church has made. And so often we focus on prosperity instead of peace. And when there's this incredible amount of peace, guess what always comes? Prosperity. If you chase after peace and everybody starts getting harmonious and everybody starts working the way they're supposed to, prosperity comes. But as a country, what are we going to chase after? Prosperity. As the end. And the only way for everyone to reach prosperity is for us to walk through peace. The divorce trap is where it is for a reason. Because people aren't walking through peace, true prosperity in their relationships. I mean, there's a reason a lot of parents and kids don't talk. It's because we're not walking through the way of peace, through prosperity. Did you know, this is a crazy fact, our church had 150,000 people represented by the zip codes sitting in the pews right now. You guys represent 150,000 different people in South Carolina. Now, here's some crazy facts about that, okay? 90,000 of those people don't have a church. So right now, you represent 90,000 people who don't know Jesus Christ. And with all of you guys sitting here from... <coughs> uh, I don't know how many people live there. I can't count. About 50,000? 15? 15? Next county south of them, which is okay. Oh, that's a big one. It's a big county. It's only like three people. Okay, <laughs> three people. In. All right. So they added. We're up to one. But, but here's the thing: ninety thousand people without Christ. Here's an even crazier fact. Okay, did you know that 27,000 27, people in this zip codes alone are done here are looking for churches? They're not outside of Christ. And saying, I hate the church and I hate all Christians. They're actually sitting here saying, we don't have a relation with Christ, but we want to. That, that sounds astounding, doesn't it? But here's the incredibly ridiculous statistics that are coming out of that. If you walk up to ten people you know, three out of ten of them would say immediately, I'd love to go to church with you. If you walk up to ten random strangers, one out of ten would actually go to church just because you invited them. That's how desperate people are for a church. Now let's be honest. Do you know why I don't ask ten people? Why we don't ask ten people? Why don't we ask ten people? Embarrassed. We're embarrassed because we don't want to hear no seven times. Right? 
from people we know. We don't want to hear no nine times from strangers. I mean, that's like taking me back to my dating life. I don't want to hear no that many times, you know? But here's the thing. They're looking for it and they want it. They, they just don't know how to get it. And that was the crazy thing about Jan and Brian and Cam. Throughout the week, I, I'm telling Jan, Jan, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. They're not going to get all of it. Because they can't possibly get all of it. But they're going to get it. She worked and prayed so hard to help students get it. She struggled with lack of response. But at some point, she asked, why aren't they getting it? And then we got to Thursday night. We did a prayer walk. And I said, I want you guys to go out and grab a stick. A stick that represents your, your sin life. Grab ten in the back. And then Jana saw these kids come. And one of the kids had got the biggest a tree branch that had fallen in the storm. And he put it on his back and had ten other, nine other sticks in his arm. And she said, Nathan, they got it, didn't they? It wasn't all wasted. And see, that's the reality of sacrifice, of peace, is they may not get it right now, but they will probably get it later. They'll get it eventually. A lot of times, this is what happens with marriage. We mess up the first time, or the second time, or the third time. But eventually, what happens? We get more and more of what it takes. We get more and more of what we're looking for. And... And we get closer. I sometimes struggle with hymns. Uh, like the ones I'm even saying today. I wish I had more of what the writer had when he said, I am thine, O Lord. I am yours, Lord. Because sometimes I, I look and I'm like, some of the things I waste my money on, I spend more money on than I do giving to the cause of God. Or sweet hour of prayer. Am I the only person who just feels embarrassed when he's singing sweet hour of prayer? I'm like, what in the world? This guy's got this incredible spiritual walk with God because I know this. Sweet hour of prayer would end up with sweet rest in prayer. An hour. Doesn't that sound like a long time? Go ahead and ask me, Nathan. What's the average amount of time the average Christian spends in prayer each day? <laughs> You want to know or not know? Yes. Three to seven minutes. It's like, whoa, no way. Sweet hour of prayer. Somebody who just loves God so much he's got that peace with God. And the people of Jerusalem thought they had a relation with God. They thought they had peace with God. But guess what Jesus is indicating by weeping over them and telling them, if only you knew it's going to bring you peace. What's he telling them? You don't get it. You don't get it. God was weeping, and they didn't realize how far they were from him. The neat thing is, he doesn't give up on them. He goes into Jerusalem anyway, and he dies for their sins anyway. And Jesus tells them, the days will come upon you. This is uh, continuing this passage in Luke. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. The foundation of peace, Jerusalem, is going to be attacked. It's going to be surrounded by siege machines. And this is about 30, 40 years after Jesus dies. This happens. And the city of peace is going to lose its temple. It's going to get destroyed. The city of peace is going to have whole families get wiped out. The city of peace is going to realize that they never got what they wanted for. And here's why. Jerusalem was seeking peace through aggression. They were trying to incite a rebellion against the Romans. And it wasn't going to be until Jerusalem, the people of God, gave up on the fight that they were actually going to get what they wanted. They'll dash into the ground, Jesus said, you and your children within your walls. They won't leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. Okay. They won't leave one stone on another. When you hear that phrase... Any kind of pick on you? How big do you think those stones were? Huge. See, when I hear stone, you know what I think of? I mean, I think a huge stone is this by this, okay? A huge stone would weigh 
few thousand pounds, right? The smallest stone that was overthrown on the temple when it was destroyed weighed more than your car. Now your truck. You drive a truck, your stone's bigger, okay? Your, your truck is bigger than the stone. But if you drive a car, guess what? Those stones weigh more. Nathan, those are the smallest stones? What about the biggest stones? Are you ready? Grab 14 semis. Fill them up to the legal limit with stuff. And the largest stone they found thrown over in Jerusalem is the size, weighed as much as 14 semis fully loaded. The Romans were so mad at the Jews that they came and they moved a stone that was 570 tons. Can you imagine being someone so angry with someone? You've got all your friends to move 5,570 tons worth of... That's a lot of anger. That is a lot of mouths. We think, oh man, someone really hates me. 570 <coughs> tons. That's what war got. That's what fighting got. That's what arguing with the Romans got. So if we want to follow Jerusalem into destruction, what should we do? Fight some more. Argue some more. Try to win the argument with my spouse. Try to win the argument with my child. But instead, I want to follow God. Then I need to gleefully embrace the choice Jesus made. He wept for the city. He wept for the people. He went in and died for the city. And he died for the people. He realized that the best isn't found working against. It's in falling in love with them in spite of what they've done to you. In spite of how they treat you. In spite of what has happened. I've always wanted God to reach down and touch me. You know that moment, that unquestionable moment when he was there? I'd had one of those moments, but I didn't feel him touch me. I just knew he was there. Um, and it was about 15 years ago, um, 13 years ago, actually. But I've always wanted that touch of God. And Isaiah 25, 8 tells me this about weeping. God will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from every face. He'll remove the disgrace of people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Why does Jesus tell me to weep? Because every time I weep over someone, the hand of God touches my face. Every tear that we shed is a chance for God to reach down and put his hand on his child's face and say, I love you. I'm catching every tear. I love you. So go ahead and keep on weeping. Keep on crying. Because in that, you are experiencing the peace of God. The peace of God is found in being powerless. It's found in being broken. It's found in choosing to lose when you could have won. After all, Jesus said, I could have called how many angels? Could he have won? He could have won the argument. He could have said, lightning comes strike. And he could have won. He could have said, rocks become bread. And he could have won. He could have said, People turned to dust, and he could have won, but instead he chose to die and lose. I, I don't know how to tell you how to apply this sermon. There are no specifics in your life, but I know for me personally, this sermon is to change. The next time I want to tell Tara, you're wrong. Do you know what I need to do? Do my best to serve. <coughs> Turn the other cheek.
to go to the extra mile, to give my hope, to give whatever it takes. The next time I want to argue with my kids, you know what I need to do? I need to weep. I need to give. I need to love. I need to sacrifice. The next time I want to argue with somebody who's in authority over me or who's next to me, or the next time I want to treat my waitress or waiter like their servants, I need to stop and say, am I giving? Am I sacrificing? Am I inspiring? Because that's what Jesus did. Let's pray. Lord and Father, the sacrifice of Jesus has inspired billions of people to follow. Lord, help us to be among them. Lord, help us not just to be a decision we made 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 1 year ago. Help it instead to be a decision we're making now. To love our husband, wife, children, parents, grandchildren, friends, whoever it is in our life, we love them so unconditionally that we'll walk through the way of peace. Draw us near. Lead us close. And help us to surrender like Jesus did. In his name we pray. Amen. Real quick, the most powerful symbol of surrender ever introduced in the church. Something called that. And it's a decision we make after we believe in Jesus Christ. After we say, hey, I'm surrendering, turning my life around to live according to the laws He's given me. Then we walk through this thing, this symbol of complete surrender. People say, why do you have to be the back to Because you say, Jesus, I want to die just like you did. And if you've been baptized, remember what you claim. <coughs> a new life, a new way, a way of peace instead of a way of right. A way of Force. The way of power. No, no. I'm dying that way. And I chose to live my life and accept Jesus Christ one day. Now, if you want to make a decision like that today, you are invited to do that. Let's stand and we'll stand. If you want to make a decision, come forward. Right?